This is the story of the greatest plant invasion the world has ever known. Holding in its spiny grip a vast area of pastoral and agricultural land, spreading at the rate of one million acres a year. And it shows how armies of insects were mobilized by scientists to defeat the insidious invader. Prickly pear plants were brought to Australia with the first colonists in 1788. Later, they were grown as hedges around homesteads and in this way secured a footing in country districts. The plants soon escaped from the hedges and increased so rapidly that in 1925, the peak of the invasion, 60 million acres of land were included within the prickly pear area, an area greater than that of England and Wales. Prickly pears are natives of North and South America. Here we see the pest pear, Opuntia inermis, which is the most common of the several species that have become established in Australia. This is the spiny pest pear, Opuntia stricta, which covered large areas in Queensland. The heavy crops of fruit were eaten by emus, crows and other birds, which carried the seeds over the country. In this manner, seedlings appeared miles from the parent plant and served to start new infestation. Just look at that crop of fruit. Here we have the velvety tree pear, Opuntia tomentosa, which forms impenetrable scrubs in parts of central Queensland. Many of these plants are 30 feet high. The dreaded tiger pear, Opuntia orontiaca, with its long sharp spines, grows in many districts. This is a typical growth of prickly pear, impenetrable to man or beast. Countries such as this covered millions of acres. For mile after mile, roads were prickly pear-lined avenues wending their narrow way through the country. Cleared fields were rapidly overwhelmed in its advance. At first, odd plants became established, and within a few years, the field became a dense mass of prickly pear. Efforts to prevent its progress were unavailing. Frequently, the selector was driven from his holding. Pastoral properties were overrun and had to be abandoned to the pests which even overgrew the old homesteads. The settler battled hard and tried many methods of coping with the increase of the pear. Digging up and burning the plants was far too slow and much too costly. This illustrates a better method, spraying with arsenic pentoxide, effective against a scattered pear, but not practicable against dense pear which cost up to 20 pounds an acre to poison. In 1920, entomologists were dispatched to America to search for and study the insects which attack and destroy prickly pears in North and South America. The reason prickly pear became such a pest in Australia was that these natural enemies had not been introduced with it. Here we see the entomologists at work in America. The introduction of these natural enemies of the pear was suggested as early as 1898 and was advocated by the Queensland Prickly Pear Travelling Commission in 1914. Then the Great War intervened. At last in 1919, at the instance of the Advisory Council of Science and Industry, the Commonwealth Prickly Pear Board was created and financed by the Commonwealth, Queensland and New South Wales governments. Breeding stations were established in America so that prickly pear insects could be reared free from the parasites which in turn hold them in check. For instance, here we see calcid wasps laying eggs in cocoons of a prickly pear moth. Ladybird beetles and their camouflaged grubs feed on cochineal. The ladybird is wearing a dark ensemble, whereas her friend the grub is the energetic little chap with the hairy legs enjoying a hearty repast. In order that the insects may increase quickly when imported into Australia, all their parasites must be excluded in America. But more important still, each kind of insect is tested on a wide variety of plants to prove that it will not live on any plant other than prickly pear and cannot therefore be harmful to crops. These prickly pear beetles are being tested on sugarcane on which they must either feed or starve to death. Within a week, they have died. Garden and other crops are specially grown for the purpose of carrying out these tests. The tests are conducted exhaustively and are repeated in Australia. 
These insects are being tested on peaches. They have not injured the fruit and have died of starvation. The next step is the folding of stocks of the selected insects to Australia with prickly pear for a food supply during the voyage. On arrival at the Sherwood Laboratory near Brisbane, the insects are unpacked into cages in the quarantine infectories. The board's entomologists have studied 150 kinds of prickly pear insects in different parts of America. About 50 kinds have been introduced into Australia. Some failed to become acclimatized, others have been discarded for various reasons. After a period in quarantine, the insects are reared in cages out of doors. The main breeding work is conducted at several field stations in the prickly pear country, where hundreds of cages are used to rear the insects. Until 1925, the most promising insects were cochineal and the plant bug Kalinidia. Cochineal insects, which suck the juice of the plants, are protected by a woolly covering. In this view, the covering has been removed. It is said that the first introduction of prickly pear was due to Governor Phillips desiring to establish the cochineal industry in order to obtain scarlet dye for the British soldiers' uniforms. Cochineal favours the young growth, which dries up from its sucking action. Calanidia also sucks the juices of the pear. See how the eggs are laid on the spines. There are two generations each year. These are the young bugs which pass through several molts before becoming adults, from which they do not differ very greatly, except that the young ones do not possess wings. They prefer the fruit and young growth. When they congregate in dense numbers, the fruit is often destroyed in quantities. The young shoots are prevented from developing and the plants are considerably weakened. The mottled leaf plainly shows where they have been at work. And now we see the most important insect of all, called Cactoblastus cactorum. Its introduction from the Argentine in 1925 soon turned the scale in the battle against prickly pear. The moth lays its eggs in curious sticks, each consisting of from 50 to 120 eggs attached to the prickly pear spine. When the young caterpillars hatch, they immediately enter the pear and tunnel inside until full grown. Next, they spin white silken cocoons where they change to the chrysalis stage from which the moths emerge. Twice each year, these stages of the life cycle are passed through. The distribution of cactoblastus throughout the prickly pear country has been affected by intensive cooperation between the board, the Prickly Pear Land Commission in Queensland, and the Department of Agriculture and Prickly Pear Destruction Commission in New South Wales. Under one method, the cocoons were placed in cages where the moths emerged and laid their eggs, which were collected daily. These eggs are being weighed in order to ascertain the number. There are five million eggs in this day's collection. You doubt me? Well, <laughs> count them. Later on, most of the eggs were collected from places where they were laid thickly on prickly pear in the field. The eggs are placed in quills of waxed paper, two or three sticks of eggs in each quill, and are packed in boxes, each containing 100,000 eggs. Landowners are supplied with eggs free of cost, and vast numbers have been distributed in this way. Many millions of Cactoblastus eggs have been distributed by government action on crown lands and along roadways. The quills are pinned onto the plant. The young caterpillars escape through holes in the quills, enter the pear and need no further attention. As the caterpillars develop, the whole interior of the prickly pear may be eaten, leaving the transparent cuticle through which they are plainly seen. Now the cuticle has been torn away to show the caterpillars. Look at them running to and fro, very annoyed at being disturbed. 
bacterial and fungus rots follow the work of the caterpillars and complete the destruction. The caterpillars spin cocoons among the dead pair and Cactoblastis multiplies and spreads without further assistance other than the initial cost of its establishment in a locality. Often the plant is killed even to its roots by the first onslaught of Cactoblastis. More frequently, however, after the initial collapse of the pear, new growth springs up from the butts and roots. This regrowth may be scattered or dense. Cactoblastis soon returns to the attack. In this picture, many egg sticks can be seen on the regrowth. The pest is thus killed completely. These views are typical of the havoc caused by Cactoblastis over millions of acres. Now, the natural grass which formerly found no space to grow becomes established and takes the place of the prickly pear, thus enhancing the value of the land for grazing purposes. To look back for a moment, this picture of dense prickly pear was taken in 1926. The second view of the same area was taken in 1929 after Cactoblastis had played its role. Now that the prickly pear has been destroyed, the timber can be felled and burnt. Soon, crops are planted. Here is a field of maize on land won back from the pest, as evidenced by the few dead trees still standing, a crop promising a heavy yield. A wheat crop on reclaimed land. Note the dead prickly pear in the foreground. Great activity is taking place in the development of former prickly pear land reclaimed by Cactoblastis. Several acres of potatoes on the site of former dense pear, and quite good potatoes too. Fields of Rhodes grass have been planted extensively to provide fodder for dairy herds. Large sections of the prickly pear country are suitable for dairying. Here the Rhodes grass flourishes among the dead brigolo trees, which will fall and be burnt off later. Prosperous farms and dairymen's homes have already appeared where formerly a wilderness of prickly pear flourished. The whole of this scene was impenetrable pear as recently as 1928 until Cactoblastis waved the magic wand. And so the fight goes on with every prospect of science with the wonderful destroyer Cactoblastis as its agent, unique in its method of attack, achieving a complete victory over this great scourge.